This video is brought to you by Straight Goods News, Canada's alternative online news source. Visit straightgoods.ca. To Paul Dewar, that uh, Tommy Douglas wouldn't have provided drinks. <laughs> <laughs> but this, of course, is a nonpartisan meeting, so I hope Erwin and I and Warren are demonstrating that. Je suis heureux d'être ici avec vous et je besoin de vos félicitations aux employés. Uh, still employees, mais mm -hmm. aussi les personnes qui ont travaillé avec Rights and Democracy mm -hmm. dans les années uh, passées. C'était uh, une grande expérience pour vous, mais aussi pour le, le pays. Uh, C'est une période d'une certaine tristesse, mais uh, uh, we can't look backward all the time. I have to remind myself of that every once in a while. Uh, and you should be very proud of the things you've been able to do. Je ne vais pas parler ce soir des événements uh, des années récentes, uh, because I don't think there's much that I can add to that. But I had the honor of being the uh, minister uh, under whom uh, this center was created. I should make it very clear that while I was the minister and there was a progressive conservative government, uh, this was not at all ever a partisan undertaking. Not only did it pass with unanimity in the House of Commons, but the consultation that preceded its formation uh, was extensive, not only within Parliament, uh, but across the wide range of Canadians interested in international affairs, and particularly in human rights and in democracy. I hope. I thought what it might be most appropriate for me to do, without, not in the context of looking back, but in reminding ourselves of what we can be, is to talk about two characteristics uh, of which the center was one of the incarnations, but two characteristics of a very productive period in Canadian political and international life. I was privileged to be the Minister during uh, the Secretary of State for External Affairs during part of that time, and I'm always a little ill at ease when I'm in the presence of people who actually earned their way in to the Department of Foreign Affairs. I came in the side door the minister. But those two characteristics, it seems to me, were first an attempt to generate a consensus across party lines on critical issues. We were not able to do that always, but we were, for example, able to do that on apartheid, on a Canadian intervention that started under Alan McEachan and others, but that I was able to continue in Central America that led in time to uh, Canada becoming, taking our seat uh, at the uh, table of the Organization of American States. Uh, the very strong interest, not only in democratic institutions, but in the idea of a democratic civil society in those uh, countries that had been part of the Soviet Union after the fall of the, uh, uh, the Berlin Wall. And there were a range of others. There were also questions where we did not always agree, uh, but there was an attempt, a genuine attempt everywhere uh, to try to understand what was in the, uh, in the Canadian interest and what was, uh, what was possible. And the second characteristic was there was an understanding of the value of Canadian organizations which operated at arm's length internationally, at arm's length from the government. You know, consensus is never easy. It's essential in a country like ours, not just in foreign policy, but it's never easy. But in international policy in particular, we have to remember that it is the country which foreign policy represents. It's not a party, it's not a specific group, it's not a specific point of view, it's not a specific interest. It's the country, the country as a whole. Independent organizations NGOs and others, today are major creative forces in international affairs. Their mandate makes them so. Their mandate makes it easier for them to take the leaps of judgment and the hard decisions quickly that governments in many ways can't. And now with the combination of uh, the form of accountability and of budget cuts, the capacity of governments is even more limited than it was before. So the, the, the reliance of a creative people, the reliance of a troubled world on organizations that can act more or less independently, 
that are not bound by the policy of the day, of the government of the day, is more and more important. And that, I think, is something we have to recognize, not simply in the context of this <coughs> institution, but generally as we approach the challenges and the opportunities uh, uh, in the world. This is a world that, uh, where the, the challenges are very different uh, than they have been in the past. And from time to time, we may think that there were periods in the past where they were more lethal. But in fact, the challenges we face now are, many, are in many ways much more serious because we have not dealt with some of them before. And we are going to need that kind of imagination. And we are going to need that kind of consensus, both at home and internationally. And rights and democracy was a valiant attempt uh, to follow that path. It wasn't, it wasn't pioneering in the sense that uh, nobody started. So rights and democracy did not start that tradition in Canada. That tradition was deeply embedded. Uh, but rights and democracy at its creation and in many of its uh, functionings and activities was a, was a very clear uh, example. And whatever happens to the institution, it's the example that we have to honor. And I want to thank you all for having honored it uh, so well and wish us all well in finding ways to honor it in the future. Thank you very much.